So, so in, in the first moments of Chinese, you know, nationalist history, when they were building this idea of a Chinese nation state, uh, Tibetans weren't in the picture at all. And, and you know, the Tibetan aspiration for sovereignty has been equally ambiguous. And the truth is that both the Chinese and the Tibetans have, have coexisted for many, you know, many, many centuries, uh, millennia, um, as two civilizations side by side, developing, uh, sometimes growing, sometimes contracting, in tandem. And for most of those, you know, thousands of years, they managed to do just fine without a legal concept called sovereignty to, to define the, the nature of the relations between them. So, and particularly now, uh, particularly now when we are in a world that is increasingly, you know, interpenetrated by global flows of capital, of information, of people and technology and ideas, you know, the, the webs of mutuality that exist are only going to become more dense and, and we're not going back. So, so for these many reasons, uh, you know, I think that, it, you know, even though the Dalai Lama has you know, formally relinquished a claim to sovereignty, I think the way that people think about the problem, it, it's just, it, it anchors it still. And, and, and so it uh, creates this, uh, this difficulty in, in trying to get past that. So in, in the work that we've been doing in, in the paradigm in which we work, uh, we've been um, reaching for a new analytical vocabulary to describe what it is we want to accomplish. And in particular, uh, we're using the rubric of governance in our research and policy-oriented work uh, to think about the, uh, the, the, what it is we're doing. And governance, I don't mean the, the sort of World Bank, IMF kind of technical definition of gov good governance, of transparency and accountability, although that's one small part of it. I mean in a broader sense, uh, governance is a concept that's emerged uh, you know, over the past couple generations to describe new facts on the ground. And the world has been carved up and mapped uh, in ways that you know, it's, it's reasonably you know, clear who's in charge of what. Uh, on a planetary scale. Um, but in fact, there, the world is filled with places, and not just in the developing world, but everywhere, where things do not work uh, in, in the ideal ways that we would want them to work. So, you know, public purposes that usually you would think a govern or government would be, you know, serving, um, basic, delivery of basic services like education or healthcare, sanitation, drinking water, you know, uh, the provision of credit, agricultural <clears throat> services, uh, these things have been um, you know, neglected, they've been defaulted on. Uh, in many places, the government, even if you know, on the surface of it, it's an authoritarian government, somebody's, you know, somebody very draconian is in charge, but in fact, if you go to these places, um, you know, they're all over the world, um, there's nobody in charge, there's an abs abdication of responsibility, in fact. Um, and, and yet, and yet, uh, organized collective social life must proceed and does proceed. So governance does two things. It helps us, uh, it gives us language to start to think about how it is, what's the configuration of, of economic, social, and cultural factors that enable collective social life to continue. And the other thing is that it, it allows us to think normatively, how could it be done better? And how can we as a nonprofit or as an academic institution or as a cultural institution or whatever it is, uh, also play a role because now we better understand it. We have better language to describe what's going on. And we don't just you know, monolithically talk about that as this place or that is that place, that is Tibet and everything is black and white there. No, we, we, we see the complexities and now we have better analytical language to talk about it. So in the sovereignty paradigm, paradigm you know, the question uh, you know, is always who has the legitimacy to rule? And in the governance paradigm, uh, we, we ask a very different question. How will we make collective social life more fair, more just, uh, more cost-effective, and more responsive to basic human needs? So basically, we're, we're trying to find uh, ways to reflect the conditions uh, in, um, uh, of the 21st century world that we're in. And, uh, kind of loosening our attachments to the ideas that, you know, dominated the 20th century. Um, and with these new analytic tools, we're able to see new possibilities for action and for solutions. And I just want to give one uh, example, I'm pretty sure I'm running out of time, but um, one very powerful example for us. There's so many lessons that we've learned about education. Um, it, through the work we've done in the, the rural township of Chumba, but one in particular is about 
uh, bilingual education. Because as Lausan mentioned, uh, what we've uh, seen is that the Chumba kids uh, have become uh, the number one Chinese language students in the county. And you have to understand, these are children of subsistence farmers and herders who have to learn Chinese as a foreign language. And you know, for the, anybody who knows a little bit about Tibetan and Chinese, they have nothing in common. Syntax is different, the way the words are built, and everything is different. I mean, it's very counterintuitive, learning one across the other is difficult. And yet these children who have no media, there's no reinforcement, right, of, of, the, of, the, of the new language. Um, they're competing with children in the county seat who are the children of the cadres and the elite, and a lot of whom are Chinese. And they go home, they, they, it's not res residential schools, they only know Chinese. They don't know Tibetan at all, and they don't study it because it's not in the curriculum. And they go home, and that's their mother tongue, and it's reinforced through the media, and yet the Chumba kids <coughs> perform better on the Chinese exams as well as the Tibetan exams. So that's extraordinary. And the Litang County education people recognize that as, as, as extraordinary, and they said, very clearly that they agree that the reason why there's been this just incredible success in bilingual education in Chumba is because even though technically, formally, we're what they call a Model 2 bilingual school, which means that um, everything is taught in Chinese except for Tibetan language, which is taught in Tibetan. In fact, de facto, it's always been a Model 1 bilingual school, which our county currently has uh, we haven't had permission to build any of these, but it means that everything is taught in Tibetan except for the Chinese, which is taught Chinese. Um, and, and because we've been de facto model one, uh, our children learn faster, and, and because they're highly motivated, they're the first generation of this community that's you know, becoming literate, uh, that's learning to you know, learn all these basic skills, and so we, we have a very inspired student body. They're, they're not normal. Um, but but uh, in addition to that, they also have uh, the fact that everything is taught, is said once in Chinese, and then the teachers all switch into Tibetan. And and so because of that, when we uh, you know uh, were nearing the completion of the middle school last year, uh, the education bureau came to us and said, you know what, uh, let's make this the first model one bilingual education school in the county. And they were very excited about it. Then March happened with the unrest. And they, you know, were just, they were so sorry, but they said, you know, we can't possibly make it a model one education system school now. And we said, well, why not? And they said, because uh, it will be perceived as too nationalistic. And, it, you know, we can't do it in this, in this climate. And, and this was such an extraordinary thing because this is constitutionally enshrined, right? It's lawfully protected. Um, and uh, it's proven that it, it's going to produce not only just strong, you know, Tibetan language uh, students, but also strong Chinese language students. That it will be more effective in creating new citizens who are bilingual, and, and maybe who are very pleased to be, you know, able to be where they are and do what they're doing uh, because of their, their success. And still, even though this was clearly in the public interest, uh, there was this feeling that this is not going to be perceived uh, as politically uh, okay. So, uh, so our response to that in our governance paradigm uh, was not to complain. Um, we have actually uh, managed to uh, make the, the school, again, de facto model one bilingual education anyways. All the textbooks have been uh, procured in, in Tibetan and, and the teachers are all, uh, we had to recruit them from another province, from Qinghai. Um, because we, we didn't have um, teachers in, in our local region who could teach chemistry and computer science, all these you know, like, uh, subjects in Tibetan. So in fact, we've made it de, de facto by uh, bilingual education. Um, but we were, what we're also doing is we're convening a symposium on Tibetan educational language policy. And uh, we're bringing to, together not only high-level elite researchers from Beijing, but also the, the leading pioneers of Tibetan language uh, policy from the Tibetan region, all across the Tibetan region. And you know, when we first started doing the outreach to these people who you know, have really been the frontline advocates, the real heroes for protecting Tibetan language in this past generation, and we said to them, you know, we're going to have this meeting, and it's going to be with these people, and we can talk about these issues, and they want to hear your experience. No, they said, no, they don't. They, they won't talk to us, you know, they, they won't listen to what we have to say. And we said, oh yes, they will, because, you know, until the day that Tibetans are written out of the Chinese constitution, you know, 
talking about uh, bilingual education is, is not an act of treason. And if there is a policy environment right now where, where it is, then that, that needs to change. 